Hallelujah. Glory to God. Can we lift our hands to heaven and just thank him? Let's worship him. Let's give him praise. Let's exalt his holy name. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, because you started this year with us and you are still with us. And this is the confidence that we have in you. That when we pray according to your will, that you hear us. And that you will never leave nor forsake us. Father, we give you praise, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You may please be seated. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, we're not excited this morning. Glory to God. First, I want to appreciate with me my father, your father, the lead pastor of Harvesters International Christian Center, Pastor Bolajido. Can we appreciate him? If you love him, can you appreciate him? Glory to God. And please appreciate with me all the pastors in the house, Pastor Mayoa. Pastor Fojo and Pastor Balaji. Praise God. Okay, because of time, we're going to be moving with the speed of light, so you need to follow very closely. Glory to God. I bring greetings from the Antony campus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Like my pastor will say, that's where God is. Glory to God. I said like my pastor will say, you can't hold me responsible. Praise God. All right, let's go. Luke chapter 24, verse 45. Luke 24, we're going to be moving very quickly. I assure you that. Luke 24. Media, you need to help me. I have no scriptures in my notes and I can't search for it. I don't have the time. So you need to help me very quickly. Luke 24, 45. 45, not 25. 45. Let's start from verse 44. And he said to them, These things are words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which was written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Verse 45. It says, Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. It says, Then he opened their understanding that they may do that the disciples may do what? understand the scriptures. So it's very important that understanding plays a major role in the study of the scriptures. Praise the Lord. Understanding plays a major role. You see, many a times we read the Bible and we, some of us have developed the habit of daily um, reading of the Bible. But we need to go further than just reading the Bible. Some of us even have the culture or um, the daily habit of um, pop-up scriptures. So I was talking to some people somewhere and I asked them, do you read your Bible? And she was like, mm, well, I read devotionals. I was like, okay, that's fantastic. It's good to read devotionals. And in devotionals, they give you scriptures to read, but a lot of times there is no comprehension in that scripture. Praise the Lord. A lot of times there's no proper comprehension or proper understanding. So am I saying that devotionals are wrong? No, devotionals are not wrong, but that's you can start with devotionals, but you need to go further than reading devotionals. Praise the Lord. Because there is a way to understand the Bible. There are laws that guide um, Bible or biblical interpretation. And when we read the Bible, it's very important for us to understand because our understanding affects our what? Our beliefs. And our belief will affect our behavior. And the behavior will affect the results. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So it's so, so important to do that. We need to read the Bible. We need to understand it. Glory to Jesus. All right, so... Very quickly, so how, what are the ways, what are, the, um, what are some things that we need to learn when we're, under, when we're reading the Bible? What are some things that we need to learn when, when we're reading the Bible? Now, I'd like to also say this. Um, Paul was t- talking to Timothy, and he said to Timothy, he said that, study to, st- study to, um, 
What? Is that what is it? Let me hear. Study to show yourself approved. Yeah, study to show yourself approved. You know, what rightly dividing the word, right? Right, rightly dividing the word. Now, if he says rightly dividing the word, implicitly, it also means that you can wrongly divide the word. That's what it means. So you can read the Bible and give wrong interpretation to the Bible. So he said, study to show yourself approved. The word study there does not necessarily mean study in the way we understand it. The word study there actually means, the Greek translation really means, be diligent to show yourself approved. So he's not talking about study. He's talking about diligence. What does that mean? It means do all that you can to understand the word. So we must go beyond daily reading of the Bible and just reading the scripture. And Jesus said to Matthew, go ye and do likewise, things like that. You must go beyond just reading the scriptures to become diligent as to understand what the scripture means. Praise the name of the Lord. And one of the biggest um, instruments or tools for biblical interpretation is called the law of context. Pastor Bolaji talked about this in the last sermon, the law of context. And we're going to look at um, some scriptures to discuss the law of context. A simple scripture, Acts chapter 10 verse 9. Acts chapter 10, verse 9 to 17. I might just do a paraphrase of this scripture because of time. Acts chapter 10, verse 9 um, to 17. So this happened to Peter. Let's, let me just see if I can read the first. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. So the Bible says, On the morrow, as they went their journey, they drew near to the city, and Peter went upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Verse 10. Verse 10. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So I'm not going to read from there. I'm just going to explain. So Peter fell into a trance. And if you, if you are very familiar with this scripture, the Bible says, and a screen, like maybe a projector and a screen or something appeared to him. He saw it and began to see animals. And the Lord appeared to him. Now, I also want to use this thing to talk about something called mental models and that's something about religion. Religion is very dangerous. And I want you to see the character of Peter. And that's why if you don't understand scriptures, you can also resist God in your life. Praise the Lord. If you don't understand scriptures, God will be speaking to you. <laughs> and there's a way you'll be responding to God. And what you are doing is resisting him. So the, 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 the screen came down and he saw different kinds of animals. And these animals were animals that were written in the Old Testament that were unlawful for Jews to eat. Jews were not supposed to eat this. So you're talking about things like pigs, or you, if you've read Leviticus, how many of us have read Leviticus? A very few hands, I'm sure. Praise God. Leviticus is not easy to read. So if you've read Leviticus, you see all these laws where it says, don't eat a, a, any animal that has one stomach. You must eat animals that has four stomachs. Don't eat any animal that is the hoofs are not split in two. That must be, do you understand? So things like horses, don't eat horses. That's what Leviticus was saying. Right? So those animals appeared on the screen before Peter. And the Lord said to him, kill and eat. And Peter said, no, Lord, I will not do that. Did you hear that there's a paradox in that statement? Peter said, no, Lord. Now, to the Jews, that's a paradox. Because the way we use Lord in our time is not the way they use Lord then. So in our time when we say Lord, we say people like Lord Lugar. Lord, all those people, those people that are lords. But Lord in those days meant owner. So it was a paradox to tell your owner no. But that's what religion can do to you. Praise the name of the Lord. He said no. God was telling him kill it. He said no. The person that gave him the law, he told him no. Now basically, when he was done with that vision, the Bible says, and Peter began to try to understand the meaning of the vision. But as he was trying to understand, some men came from Cornelius because Cornelius had had a previous vision about an angel appearing to him. And the angel told him, send men to Joppa, send men to Peter and bring it to him. He will tell you words that will change your life. Um, something like that. Then Peter, I'm trying to paraphrase the story because we don't have time to read all the scriptures. So Peter now got up and followed them. Now let's read the next scripture to see. Just, we'll just read the first part of the scripture to see the interpretation. Now when we read that scripture... Some of us might think that God was talking about animals. But when we get further down, we'll see in Acts chapter 10, verse 27. Verse 27, Acts 10, 27. Acts 10, 27. And it says, and as he talked with him, he went 
in and found many that were come together. So Cornelius had bought his household. And he said, and he said unto them, Ye know how it is unlawful. It's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto another nation. But God showed me that I should not call any man what? Common or unclean. So at the end of the day, when God was showing him the vision of food, it wasn't about food. It was actually talking about the Gentiles. Praise the name of the Lord. So that means even in Leviticus, God was telling them already about that they should, when he was saying don't eat, what God was showing them in a figure was that they should not keep company with who? With Gentiles. Now, why am I saying this? This is important because you need to understand the law of context to be able to interpret a, a scripture. When you see some scriptures that are hard to interp interpret just by reading one line, what you need to do is to read it in context. And sometimes context is not just the pretext and the post-text. Sometimes context is the entire book. Sometimes context is the entire chapter. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, another scripture that has bewildered me for years is in Corinthians. Because, you know, we are all people of grace. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4. So we are people of grace. Pastor Wallach has taught us that God doesn't punish with the devil. You know, anytime you, you fall into sin or whatever it is, you know, what you tell the devil, the devil comes to accuse you of your sin, you tell the devil that, oh, this is family business, right? How many of us have heard that before? All right, respond, please. I'm begging. It's, we've heard that before. So some of us have not heard this, but it's true. It is family business. But look at what Peter says here. First Corinthians, he says, in the name, so, you see, Peter is one of the most extraordinary apostles because the way he writes or the way he uses his words, sometimes I'm, 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 I'm somehow about, I'm like, Peter, what? Or Paul, rather, what are you saying? He says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, so he was telling them, so let me give you a background. So there was a certain person in church, a guy that was committing fornication with his father's wife. And he was doing it blatantly, meaning that he would come to church. You know, imagine coming to church with your father's wife. Praise the name of the Lord. I don't need to explain what that means. Come to church and holding your father's wife's hand and sitting down together. And you are, both of you are even holding hands and praying together. Shaka baka ba. And the whole church knows, the pastor knows, everybody knows. And there's no shame. There's no, nobody saying anything. So Paul, somebody now wrote a letter to Paul to inform Paul because Paul wasn't there. So somebody wrote a letter. So those of us that, no, let me leave that alone. Let me leave that alone. I just want to encourage, no, no, let me leave it. Yes. We'll discuss that in a smaller meeting. Praise the Lord. So, somebody wrote a letter to Paul to inform Paul. So, when Paul heard, he wrote a letter back and said that he wants all of them to gather together. And when they gather together, this is what they should do. He says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, he has mentioned the name and the power. That means Jesus himself is there. The power is there. He said, with the name and with the power, this is what you should do. Next verse. He says, to deliver such unto Satan. Praise the name of the Lord. He said, with the power and with the name that is above all names, principalities and powers, including Satan, is under. He said, with that name and with that power, deliver such to Satan. Now, when you read this scripture, you'll be confused. You'll be like, is it that God can, if, okay, God wants to punish, can't God punish the person by himself? Why must he deliver him to Satan? Then, of course, you now start hearing people come with things like, oh, I deliver you unto Satan. You have offended me. I hand you over to Satan. You lied to me, I hand you over to Satan. So, but that scripture does not mean exactly what it looks like. So, what, how do we get the context? Let's go to verse 6. Let's read from verse 6. He now says, so this was when he was um, condemning them, saying, Your glory is not good. Know ye, know ye not that a little living leavens the whole lump. He's beginning to mention, talk about something else. He says, do you not know that a little living leavens the whole lump? There's another whole background here that I will not go into. Praise the Lord. But there's something here, but just take that next verse. It says, it says, purge out the old living, and ye may be a new lump, as ye are living, for Christ is our Passover, or Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Verse 8. He now says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old living, neither with the living of malice and wickedness, but with the unliving bread of sincerity and truth. It's in verse 9 that he now explains what he meant. Verse 9, it says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with who? 
fornicators. So what does he mean when he says deliver him unto Satan? Who knows? Cast him out of the church. That's what he just means. He means send him out of the church. He says because if you live in the church, what he means by a little living living the whole lump is that what he's doing, others will begin to do it. That's what he was just saying. So he says, so that others will not be contaminated, cast him out of the church. He did not really mean deliver him to Satan. Praise the name of the Lord. And so he says, oh, can we cast people out of the church? Someone said yes. So, he, he, if you read that scripture, he said that, so for the destruction of the body, so that the soul may be saved. So what is the destruction of the body? He later explained. He said that so that he will be ashamed. And because of his shame, peradventure, he will repent and we can bring him back into the church. Praise the name of the Lord. So it was not as severe as saying, I, for the, so that as Satan will now come, I've come. So inflict disease. You know Job, ten times what Job suffered, you will suffer. No. God does not do that to his children. Praise the name of the Lord. God never uses Satan to punish his children. When bad things happen to you because you have done wrong things, it can be two reasons. Number one, it can be the consequences of what you've done physically or life. Praise God. You didn't pay your tithes. Car, your car hits the wall. Bah, you're not saying, ah, it's because I didn't pay my tithes. No, that would have happened whether you paid your tithes or not. Do you understand? God doesn't punish us by putting sickness or taking our money away from us just to show us, or taking our health away from us just to show us that I'm punishing you. That's not how he does it. Praise the name of the Lord. How does God punish? Simple. He rebukes with words. That's all. How did Jesus rebuke his, his disciples? With words. He only rebuked them with what? With words. That's what God does. Praise the name of the Lord. But well, that's that one. Another. So we need to understand. So there are many ways to interpret the Bible. That's the law of context. And there are so many examples in the Bible where people misinterpret the word of God because they don't understand the law of context. Another law is the law of language. The law of language. Praise the name of the Lord. So we all know that the, the Bible wasn't written in English originally. How many of us know that? Uh, only very few. The Bible wasn't written in English originally. The Bible was written in Greek and Ara Aramaic. Praise the name of the Lord. So there had to be a translation. And in that translation, it was even translated into the first English translation was the King James. That's what we, and in the King James, English then is different from English now. Praise the name of the Lord. So there's a part of the scripture that says God is not mocked. Evil communication does what? Corrupt good, corrupts good manners. So, but by translation in the 21st century, communication means what? To talk. Right? So, so we could have translated that to mean that if I speak evil to somebody, it will corrupt their manners. Right? But most of us know that that's not what it means. It's really talking about evil association corrupts good manners. Meaning that if you have friends that are evil, you will eventually be evil. That's what he's saying. And we have um, other ways to say it now. Birds of a feather, show me your friend. Exactly. So that's basically what he's saying in that scripture. Praise the name of the Lord. There are other ways of Bible interpretation. Too. There's also what is called figure of speech. Paul used figure of speech. I remember when we were growing up as, a, as Christians, we were so zealous for God. So there was a scripture where that the Bible says that if, if I pray with voice, with, um, with the tongues of angels and with tongues of men, and these are, so we now thought that there were tongues of angels. There were tongues of men. There were now tongues to God. Praise God. So as we are speaking in tongues, Shakabah, Gadabah, that's the tongue of an angel. You are speaking the tongue of an angel. Gabriel is moving now. Gabriel. Praise God. That's so false. There are no tongues of angels. Praise the name of the Lord. There, see, when you speak in tongues, and just, you see, there are many things. I don't want to bust a lot of bubbles. But there are many things that have been misinterpreted because of the lack of Bible understanding. When we speak in tongues, Paul was clear. He said it very clearly. Every time you speak in tongues, you speak to one person. Who is that? God. So not angel, not man. The only time man has the ability to understand tongues, and it's not really understanding, it's interpretation, is when he gets the gift of interpretation. And interpretation is not translation. Praise the Lord. That's why you can hear someone say, Jekapaskota, Zelekesteke, and it goes one minute speaking in tongues, and they say, who has interpretation? And the person just comes out and say, God is here. Because interpretation and translation are not the same. 
Praise the Lord. I'll give you an example. In, so for, forgive me for those of us that don't speak Yoruba. When you hear, what does it mean? But the translation, direct translation is put your ear on the ground. But what it really means is, listen. That's how it is. So when somebody is speaking in tongues and somebody interprets, it's not translation, it's interpretation. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you can hear somebody speak for one minute and the, trans- and the uh, interpretation is just, it is well. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we don't speak in tongues of angels. What Paul was attempting to do there was it was a figure of speech. He was trying to say, even if you speak with tongues and tongues of angels and you have not love, he says your tongues is useless. That's what he's saying. It's like saying, somebody comes to you and says, give me $10,000. And the person says, I'm begging you. And he says, even if you like, even if you like, cry blood. It's a figure of speech. That's what Paul was saying. Glory to God. So when you read the Bible, you see certain places that were figures of speech. Like when Jesus said to, um, to um, Peter, get deep behind me, Satan. Somebody said that Satan entered Peter. No. He explained what he meant. He said that because thou severest not the things of God... That's why he was saying, he was saying, what you just said to me now is not the will of God. So you have acted like Satan. He did not say Satan possessed him. Praise God. So there are things that are figures of speech. Somebody says, as you are talking, Satan has entered you. Satan, Satan is talking to you. Satan does not enter believers. Amen. Glory to God. The only person that Satan entered, and the Bible said it expressly, was Judas. He said, as soon as Jesus finished speaking, he said, and Satan entered into him. He said it expressly. Was a believer. That's why Jesus said, use a scripture. He said that, is it possible for you to disarm a strong man except you first bind? Some people think that Jesus was talking about demons because he wasn't talking about demons. He was talking about the power of the Holy Ghost as against the power of demons because they were accusing him, glory to God, for using the power of demons to cast out demons. He now said that, how can demon cast out demons? He says, a house against itself will not stand. But again, he says, if I use the power of demons and not the power of the Holy Spirit, you judge yourselves. He now said that, can you do this except a strong man? Do you understand what I'm saying? The only way you can understand that scripture is to read the context. Or else, you'd have been saying, ah, Jesus is saying we should bind demons. Please, number one, has Jesus ever bound any demon before that you have been reading the Bible? No, what he does is that he casts them out. You can't bind demons. If we could, we'd have bound all the demons by now. Praise the name of the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? Have I, have I busted your bubble? The look that I'm receiving now is more like, hey, I'm in trouble. You mean all the demons have been bound, they are not bound? You mean they are still roaming free? God. When the Bible says, this is a lot of explanation, I wish I didn't get into this. When the Bible says, whatsoever you bind in heaven shall be bound on earth, and whatsoever you bound on earth shall be bound in heaven, it means whatsoever you allow or disallow. So when you see a demon and you cast the demon out, you can refrain the demon from functioning in that area. Praise the name of the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? What you are doing is that the demon will still be active, but only outside your domain. Glory to God. That's what it means. It means that once you cast him out in your domain, he can't function. He has to go outside your domain. Anywhere you go, he will move away from there because he recognizes your authority. That's why the demons looked at the um, sons of Sceva. He says, Paul, we know. P- um, Jesus, we know. Who are you? It means that we, did not, we, don't, we don't see you in the realm of the spirits. We see Paul. We see Jesus, but we don't see you. So if the demons recognize you, they cannot function where you are. That's why a man like Bishop Oedipo can enter a car. Somebody will be possessed with demons. He said, tell the person to enter. And the person was mad outside. But as the person entered the car, it became perfectly normal. The demon waited outside. Glory to God. So that's what it means. Not binding. My time is almost up. I need to rush. So how do we, number one, how do we receive the word of God? I'm going to leave out a lot of scriptures, but let's go. I'll call them up, but I won't read them. I'll just, Jay, how do we receive the word of God? Number one, it must be received with meekness. James chapter 1, verse 21. James 1, 21. The Bible says, receive the engrafted word of God with meekness. And in this generation, we need to be careful. This is the, one of the worst generations when it comes to the word of God. Because this is the information generation where everybody has an opinion. Everybody can contact. You are too intelligent for God. Hallelujah. So every God will say something, you want to eulogize, philosophize, intellectualize what God is saying. Do 
you understand? Hey, no, 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 no. According to Constantine in the 1540s, you know, Aristotle said, what goes up must come down. <laughs> Praise God. You can't benefit from God's word if you stand against God's word. Bible says, speak to those that oppose themselves. He says you can pray for them. But he says for the ones that oppose the truth, he says you can do nothing for them. So let me explain. Okay, no, I can't explain that. <laughs> Praise God, there's no time. When you're, okay, let me explain. When you oppose yourself, means that you believe the word and you doubt it tomorrow. He says those kind of people, pray for them. They've received the word, but they doubt tomorrow, they come back tomorrow. But those that oppose the truth don't receive the word. Praise the God. They, don't, they stand against the word. He says for such, you cannot pray for them. Don't be that kind of person that we can't pray for. Because when we pray for you, God will still do what one thing. What he does first is to send his word. If you can't receive his word, you can't receive his help. Praise the name of the Lord. So the next one, praise God. Wow. Is you must do it with faith. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. It says they received the word, but it did not mix with faith. So if, you don't, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't mix with faith, that means you don't believe the word. You must believe the word. You, see, you don't have to understand the word first. You must first believe the word. Glory to God. And believing is not, a, it's not an intellectual thing. It's a position. Do you understand what I'm saying? Believing is, a, is where you are. It's like how Kenneth Copeland said, he said, what he say? He said, if a man says, I fell down from the moon, I entered into the Pacific Ocean, I swam, and I came to your church to give a testimony. And he said, I did it by the power of God. He says his position will be to believe him first before he starts to think about how can a man fall down from the moon? Praise the Lord of God. Praise, praise God. Because believing is a position. You are disposed to believe in God. Glory to God. All right, let's go. Then the next one is receive it with joy. Psalm 119 verse, um, verse 162. It says, I found your word and your word was a rejoicing of my heart. It was like I, as though I found what great spoil. So this is another thing that believers, is a culture we don't really have. When we are teaching the word of God, some people have this disposition and it's a wrong disposition. When you're hearing the word of God, and this is how you're looking. When I say, yes! Why are you shouting? Why are you shouting now? What have they said now? That's a terrible place to be. Let me tell you the best way to receive the word of God. And it's not something that comes naturally. You practice it. I learned it from a girl very, very many years ago until I learned that it was true. When God's word is being preached, this is how you sit down to listen. Hey! Yes! You know how you behave when they are playing a football match. That's how you behave when you listen to the word of God. It must be like the rejo- The Bible says... It was like a man that found great spoil. What does that mean? Like you were walking on the road and you found a hundred million dollars. How will you behave? That's the way you behave when you hear the word of God. That's how. Somebody says, hey, it doesn't feel that way. Make it feel that way. <laughs> Glory to God. You make it feel that way. You make it feel. You love God's word. You cherish God's word. When you hear it, it's like one that has found great spoil. When I'm at home and I receive revelation, my wife is in the room. She just says, yeah! She just goes, what's wrong? I say, I got it! 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 Hey! She's like, kilo shema into your law. What did you get? Boy, someone has received great spoil. I can't share some experiences because of time. Let me go. All right, but that's how you have to be. Next one. See, God, oh, let's leave that. Next one. I don't have time. I don't have time. Praise the name of the Lord. It says, also, you must receive it and act on it. You must be disposed to act on it. Joshua tells us that. He says, meditate upon it to observe, to do. So your meditation is that you are meditating with the inclination to do the word of God. So basically, a way to, see, this is how you are reading the word of God. You are reading it, and this is how you are on your mark. You are ready to do. Somebody put it this way. God better not tell me anything to do that he's not serious about. I would have done it before he said, ah, I'm just joking. That's your disposition. That before God tells you something to do, you first think about it. Let's not joke or you know him. If we tell him now, he's done. If you have that kind of disposition, the Bible says the Lord, his eyes go to and fro, looking for whom to show himself strong to. God does, once you are that kind of person, God's eye doesn't need to go to and fro again. He just comes to you. He doesn't need to look for a man again. He just comes to you because he has found a man after his heart. Glory to God. 
So that's the disposition. So now, lastly, very quickly, I'm going to have to speed this up. Very quickly, I'm going to have to speed this up. So how do we apply the word of God? Number one, we meditate on the word. Now, how did I get to the point of screaming and saying, yeah, I got it, I got it? It's because I sit down with the word and I repeat it to myself over and over again. I read three or four different easier translations. I see what it really means. Like the first time I mentioned when I was saying, when I used to be afraid of demons, evil spirits, I can't tell you all the story. But I now read Colossians chapter 2 verse 15, that he has spoiled principalities and powers. I went to check the meaning of spoil and I found that it meant that he had dislodged them. You know when you go to war and you conquer a nation, that nation goes and takes all that they have. They ransack them, strip them of all that they have and take it. I now read it that in Ephesians that he did all this for the sake of the church. That means, hey, 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 can you see why I'm jumping again? Because it's coming to me again. He says, God, Jesus, did not have to do what he did because he didn't need that power. He did it for your sake, for you and I. He went and plummeted the devil so that you may have authority above all principalities and powers, that you may be seated in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. That's why you can never be afraid of any demonic force. On the hierarchy of power, you are far above them. Glory to God. Jesus didn't need it. He's God. That's why when he was going back to heaven, he said, Father, glorify me with the, with the glory that I had with you in the beginning. So that power, when he came up, I said, all power is given unto me. It was not the power that he needed. It was the power that you needed. Glory to God. He did it for your sake. Glory to God. All right, so that's what meditation does. It gives you, it shines light on the word. And expounds it to you further such that you own it. Glory to God. Sorry, let me just quickly go again. All right. Next one. You confess the word. So, of course, meditation will always lead to confession. If you're spiritual, there's no way you hear that and not say, you know, the next thing, after I said that, I say, oh, God, I'm a, I'm a principal. Do you know you're a principality? How many of us know? People think that principality means evil spirit. No. Principality means people, someone of authority and power in an area. That's a principality. So when we are far above principalities, what does that mean? You are a principality. Hey, you don't understand. You are a, so you recognize yourself as a principality. That's why you can't be afraid of demons. You can't be afraid of witches. That's why someone like Idaosa will tell, will go on television and say to the witches that are coming, he said that if any of them come, all of them will die. And they understood this, this power. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it is not for somebody, it's not for bishops or it's not for pastors, it's for children of God. He says, this sign shall follow them. Who? Them that believe. Not them that pastor or them that are bishops. He says, them that believe. If you believe, you're a principality. Glory to God. So confessing, and you need to confess it. Because confession is not to God. Because God has settled it. Confession is for you. Confession is not to convince God. The Bible says he has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Everything is given. But confession is for you so that you meditate. And that's, you see, you don't rush. You start, I'm a principality. I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Ah, glory to God. What does that mean? That means in this area, if there are witches and wizards, I can stop all their functions. If they are me meeting, I can stop their meeting. Glory to God. If they are afflicting any member of my family, for my names, for my sake, I can stop them. Ah, what does that mean again? If, I'm, if I feel like I don't have a child, I can call that child first. Oh, glory to God. I'm a principality. If they stop, if this is the fifth, the 700 generation, and they place the curse on my family, they don't need to go to any pastor. All I need to do is speak the word. I'm a principality. As you are saying it to yourself, it's becoming real to you. I don't understand. Have you ever in your life entered into? I don't know. Maybe some of us have not. But there are times where what you are seeing is not what what others are seeing. Oh, there was a time, where, and it still happens to me now. I enter a place, maybe I enter into a bus or something. I sit down. Somebody steps on me. I say, don't worry, it's okay. Because in my mind, I'm somewhere better. I could just be in my private jet then. Glory to God. <laughs> That's what confession does to you. You are not seeing what other people are seeing. People are complaining, you can't complain because ah, you have gone above that realm. Hey, and we are those that call those things that are not as though they were. Those are the kind of people we are. When we speak, we create. We are like our Father God. Where do all these things come from? Confession and meditation. But if you sit down with this lover, Insta blog, um, Big Brother Niger, my brother and my sister, you'll be like that man that was wearing a big bishop chain, entered a plane, I was saying, thank you, bless you, bless you, bless you. But as soon as the plane started shaking, shock, but no. Because at some point, it's what you really believe that will come out of you. Praise the name of the Lord. 
Glory to God. Then finally, finally, there's the last scripture, the last point we're going to look at. Act on the word. So we take act and patience. Just act on the word. I've talked about act, so we just go patience. Patience is the next one. Bible talks about being patient. So some of us, when we, use, when we begin to apply the word of God, we expect it to work the next day. See, let me tell you two things about God. Number one is that he's not a magician. Yeah, God is not a magician. Mm. Things that you will find that will happen instantaneously most of the time will be healings. Most of the time. Even sometimes those things, it takes processes. But anything that has to do with finance, career, marriage, all those things, it can happen instantaneously. And those things, a lot of factors. But most of the time, it takes time for two reasons. Anything that comes within the realms of men, God needs to convince men. Praise God. Glory to God. Let me, it's a simple way. Has God ever told you to give somebody money and you didn't give the person? Exactly. Was that person praying for the money? Yes. So what God does is if he talks to you and you don't do it, he leaves you and looks for somebody else. That can take time. You, that's a practical way of explaining it. It can take time. Then also the second thing is that those things are meant to build you up as a person because God is more interested in who you become than the things that he wants to give you. Because he doesn't want at the end of the day, when he gives you those things, you now become an embarrassment to the kingdom. Praise the name of the Lord. He doesn't want you to be like Solomon. After becoming all the wealth, you now have 700 concubines to match your money. Praise God. I've, I've ne- I've, have you, has anybody ever thought about Solomon? I don't understand the wisdom behind it. I'm sure he would have forgotten some wives, their names. Hey, what's your own name? When did I marry you? Have, I, have we? Oh, you are still, you are December 2015, 2023. Okay. Um, just make sure, bring her forward, bring her forward. She looks nice. Praise God. That's what happens when money misses root. Glory to God. But God wants people that will be city set upon a hill. People that will represent his name. Bible says that we are the glory of the world, Lord. The, 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 it, the um, Latin word is imago de. Imago de means the glory of God. When the Bible says, make them in our image, in our likeness. In other words, we're saying that make them to reflect our glory. So that when people see us, the human men will be the physical representation of the glory of God. That means if somebody wants to see the glory of God, they don't need to pray to see the glory of God. They just need to see you. That's why Jesus Christ said that, Philip, he says, are you still looking for God? If you have seen me, you have seen God. Glory to God. And that's why we are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. So that if men see us, they see God in their lives. Amen. Amen. So remember that when we believe God for things, when we are praying, when we are using the word, what is most important is who we become and not what we have. Can we rise up this morning as we pray? Glory to God. Glory to God. Can we just lift our hands to heaven and thank him and give him praise and declare that the word of God is honored in your life. Tell him that you are submitted to the word of God today. The Bible says it is God that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. You are submitted to God's word. In the mighty name of Jesus. The word of God is honored in all areas and in all aspects of your life. Every area and aspect of your life will bring glory to God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise, O God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may please be seated. Can we appreciate Jesus Christ?